Now, how does an UAS look like? If you can imagine the drone in your mind, probably all of you will have a different picture. And why is that? Because there are so many types of drones. Right now, the most commonly uh, the most common view is the uh, off the shelf Best Buy, Amazon bought little drones that are quadrocopters or hectocopters. But if you would just see the types and classification of UAS and the designs, you will see that there is much, much more into that topic. First, the different shapes and sizes. You can see here how the airframe can be shaped totally differently and some of them look really awkward. Some of them look like planes, some more like helicopters. This also shows the variety in sizes and this picture is not scaled because it would be impossible that the mosquito or the skate will be even visible if I will keep the global hawk up to scale. This is a huge aircraft that looks looks like an airplane. You will not recognize it. Uh, you will not even think about it as a drone, but like a regular aircraft. And the designs. I picked some for you. Uh, this is the, uh, the Global Hawk I pointed on before. Uh, there are some that look like airplanes, the fixed wing. There are some that have a, a multi-rotor. Rotors. There are some that are fun and small. There are some that don't even look like a, a drone, more like a cleaning device or a UFO, or UFO. It's just all put in the same huge um, term, term of UAS because it flies autonomously without the person on board. Uh, and it's uh, and it it is it is a system. So there's so many shapes and sizes that you can only imagine. If you see the different designs and sizes, you already can hear uh, can assume that people will try to classify them to uh, for um, for practical purposes. And you can um, classify them by a lot of things, but by physical size, it's the first like small. Is it small, big? But then you need to come into the the brackets, like what is actually which category, and how do you even measure the size? Do you measure the wingspan? Do you measure uh, if what if the aircraft doesn't have wings? Then the next classification is maybe we'll weight it. We will see how much does it weigh, and then we'll, we'll make the size based on the weight. Uh, uh, then then endurance. How long can it fly? Altitude. How high does it fly? The wing loading. The engine type. How is it fueled? The range. The performance and the classifications multiply and multiply and multiply. Also, it can be classified by two of them. So by, uh, for example, low altitude, high endurance, but or high altitude, low endurance. Uh, here there's there is um, uh, there is an extensive article about the UAS classification. You can have you can see here that there are one uh, the classification that it comprises only one factor, two or even th three factors. There are also simplified classifications that is good to know. I don't recommend reading the whole article and learning about all development of the cl classification and terminology, but there are some shortcuts or some, uh, some names of the classes of the UAS that will be, will appear in the papers, uh, or when you will be looking for some information and, uh, hail and mail and lail, um, look unfamiliar if you don't know uh, the classification. This is uh, high altitude, low endurance, medium altitude, long endurance, long, uh, uh, low altitude, long endurance, and you can play with the letters. They make up their own shortcuts all the time. There is one significantly different uh, classification that um, each airplane can fall into this category. So, be tall. It's a vertical takeoff and landing. So it can be large, small, long endurance or uh, short endurance aircraft. But if it uh, lands and takes off vertically, it also belongs to this category. This is a really uh, uh, important category from the operational point of view. 
here you have the small table that uh, um, shows uh, the examples of this uh, of the of the categories and also the the range and the flying altitude and also the source of the diagram it shows who made the um, the brackets who made up the numbers because there is no general classification that everyone will follow every single agency every single country every single legislation they create their own classification and they stick to that so something that is called um, mini uav in the us can mean something different or be called a micro uav in europe because of the different classification and ranges there is much, much more about the classifications in the article when you click the link. And uh, I recommend the, um, uh, the article about uh, classification here. It's not a research paper. It's short and uh, it, it clarifies a lot of the confusion about what's the minimum, uh, small, medium, high, endur uh, high endurance, low altitude, and explains uh, all the shortcuts that are essential. How does it in UAS work? We mentioned before that this is a system, so it comprises with a lot of elements. And uh, the essential three elements was a vehicle, Grand Coastal Station, and a link. Uh, now, the mission planning element, this is uh, included in the Grand Coastal Station. It can be planned before. It is used widely with the data acquisition because we have more control over the flight if it's uh, executed autonomously and pre-programmed. But we can also use the uh, command and control element uh, as the pilot, the remote pilot, and fly the airplane wherever we want. This is that there are different types for different uses. If you are participating in the drone race, you are definitely not going to pre-program the flight. You're just going to use the uh, the remote to do that. But this is just the um, part of the system that can be co controlled from uh, by different devices. There is the communication link. There is. Uh, for some of them, there is a launch and recovery element. You will see this a lot uh, with the small UAS that we will be working with that are a little bit too big for the hand launch, but are still in the category that um, falls into the commercial use in accordance with the U.S. law. Um, so there is a... There is a lot, especially with the fixed wing, that includes the launch launching element. There is also a payload, something that is essential for us. You can see here, uh, you, it's not essential for functioning of uh, and for flying the the drone. Again, you're not going to have a payload if you're going to do the drone race. But if you want to collect the data, the data needs to be collected by something. Uh, so the payload is this something. Sometimes it is integrated into drones, so you don't really see any payload sticking out. But this is still an element that is crucial uh, if you if you want to process the data. What are the sensoring payloads? We're going to focus on. Uh, on them more later, just for the overview, there are some that are optical, electro-optical, that are infrared, that are uh, multispectral and hyperspectral hyper imaging. All of them are widely used for mapping purposes. Uh, there is There are some active sensors like uh, laser radar or the LIDAR um, or SAR, synthetic aperture radar. But there are also some sensing payloads that are collecting data about chemical, biological, uh, radiological, and, and uh, nuclear detection. So it does need to be used only for mapping. But if we, in the course, are going to do the 3D model uh, mapping, for, uh, UAS mapping for 3D modeling, this is what's, uh, what's the most important for us. The payload that is RGB cameras. Most of the drones that you can see available in the market right now have RGB cameras that are cheap. Also, if they have no payload, you can just buy a camera off the shelf or even mount your phone there. Anything that captures the regular imagery. And based on this regular imagery, you can obtain 
spatial data after processing. And it's what we're going to learn in a couple weeks here. More advanced way for collecting spatial, uh, spatial data is the infrared sensors that include uh, one more infrared band. This is widely used in agriculture. If you have more bands, you can have multispectral or even hyperspectral sensors. You can have laser scanners and thermal sensors. Thermal sensors are not widely used in mapping because of the um, restrictions and some challenges about uh, mapping, but they can be coupled with different sensors and then you can, uh, you can create thermal maps.